welcome everybody to this meeting. Uh, I was challenged to do it all by heart. Uh, it's a topic that's very much to my heart. Uh, this is a very old uh, poster uh, in 1984, I believe, or 85, might, might be, uh, where we collected money for a miner, and a miner showed up and gave a very vibrant speech. Uh, I thought it would be best. You're going to see a lot of talking heads this weekend. So to start with some images, so we can plunge into the period. Uh, hit the button. And what was it like, South Wales miners going up to Nottingham to pick it? Quite frightening at times, quite frightening. Uh, when we went to Orgreave and, uh, and we had the, the police with the horses, seeing them horses, and they wasn't small horses like we see around here. They were, they were big and seeing them charge, it was, it was frightening. And who didn't get out of the way, he was trampled, you know. Uh, certainly there are about five to five and a half thousand people here. They have come from Scotland, Wales, the northeast of England. They were coming all through the night in coaches. We were expecting a large number, and of course we have a large number of police officers here. They were, they were arrested four times. Never charged with anything. And had you done anything wrong? Uh, just attending. Just, just by being there, I was deemed to be a threat. We'd fought for a year, gone without so many things, and his heart was really in wanting to win this battle and keep the pits open. And we all sort of went to this one area, I, I can't exactly remember exactly where it was, looked around and there was police everywhere, there was just police, there was horses and everything. So like, we started shouting at them and they, and they started pushing us back. And all of a sudden, you'd have trenchants coming over the top and just hitting it on the end. You know, we wasn't, uh, at the time, we wasn't, uh, we wasn't nasty in any way. But um, it did get nasty after because a lot of, what, from what I've seen, a lot of people were just sort of looking after themselves, protecting themselves and protecting others. You know, there was people, like, I've seen people on the floor getting hit, getting kicked. Still pushes, you push us back. That's all we want to do. All we are doing is want to fight for our job. Nothing else. At what stage did did you feel that you weren't going to win the strike, or you weren't going to get a successful outcome and save the pits? Probably about a month before the strike ended, you know, we knew then that uh, it wasn't it wasn't going to win. We weren't going to win the strike. You know, the government wasn't going to give up. Basically, they probably spent so much money on on the strike. It, it not only went police wages and on everything like that. It must have cost them a fortune, really. So we knew they wasn't going to spend all that money and then back down. We were 40 years on, but from what we had to what we've got, I love being in a little village full of miners and miners' wives and miners' families. Not anymore. My mental health went down a little bit because when pitch it, it, it left a void. And that's not been filled as yet. Something missing. Goldthorpe has never forgotten, never forgiven. A former pit village where the mining spirit endures, celebrating the demise of the woman they believe destroyed their community, carrying a coffin through the streets. Nobody I spoke to had watched the real funeral. This was the send off they felt Margaret Thatcher deserved. Can I just ask, is it the right time to have a party, really? Yeah, yeah it is, brilliant yeah. Time. Why? Brilliant time because you party. ruined this community. Brilliant party Absolutely. Ruined the community, ruined families, people's lives. I lost my house, I lost my furniture. Community's dead, every pub and club's shut, and she did it. For some, what happened here today will seem offensive. But in South Yorkshire, they were looking for closure to toast the passing of the woman they blame for their troubles. around 50 demonstrations all around the country today. 
people can't speak out, then the government will do whatever they want and people need to have the right to speak out. Any government needs to be held to account and by protesting you hold a government to account, otherwise it becomes a dictatorship. Move to one side! Move to one side and let through. Okay, that's it. I thought we better start off with some images. Um, highlighting the significance of the miners' strike in the 80s is not just about the past. It's just its lessons will contribute for the future. The repression of the strikes set an alarming policy of secret state interference, of, criminali of criminalizing the strikers, of police repression, of smear campaigns, political and legal interference in industrial disputes, union busting, in which the British ruling classes form an example for their European allies, uh, leading the way in diminishing the right to protest, suppressing anti-racism protests. Yeah, thank you very much. And for instance, nowadays, to attack climate activists with long-term imprisonment. The increase in repression amplifies that one of the characteristics of neoliberalism is that it actively aims to break down solidarity. Now, for us to understand the Tories' position on the strike and Thatcher's personal interference with the miners, we have to go back to the previous Conservative cabinet, the one with Edward Heath as Prime Minister. Assuming office in June 1970, Ted Heath launched a restrictive trade union law into being the Industrial Relations Act. The act sought to empower trade union leaders while disempowering the shop floor, the rank and file of the union. The de de decades leading up to the Tories regaining power were characterized by unofficial wildcat strikes throughout the economy. Right-wing politi politicians from Labour to Tories believed that trade union leaders had lost control over their members. The Industrial Relations Act limited wildcat strikes and it also established the National Industrial Relations Court, which was empowered to grant injunctions to prevent strikes and to settle labor disputes. But now jumping to conclusions, the conservative attempts to weaken the workers' power failed, thanks to the Dockers. Early 1970s, the container revolution hit the British docks industry and it hit hard. Jobs losses reached a crisis point, but the Transport and General Workers Union responded with its usual lethargy. Now, as a side note, let me explain what a container revolution is. Um, containers had been first developed by the American Army in the Second World War, and it effected in a dramatic undermining of the job security of the dockers. And before the introduction of the containers, all cargo coming in or leaving Britain had to be moved by dockers by hand. And a network of unofficial militants loosely organized in the National Port Stewards Committee took up the struggle for jobs, security, and began a nationwide campaign of picketing and blacking. And blacking is the pra practice of refusing to handle certain goods, mostly used as a political or strategic means. The campaign was mainly organized outside the trade union bureaucracy. Welcome. Um, and all of the important decisions were put to an open vote at regular mass meetings. But the Dockers moved closer and closer to a showdown with the, with the Tory government and their new law, since this national uprise was exactly the kind of wildcat action that the Industrial Relations Act was designed to prevent. So on the afternoon of Friday, July the 21st of the year 72, the National Industrial Relations Court issued warrants for the arrest of five London dock shop stewards. And even before the gates of the Pentonville prison shut behind the five workers, 65,000 dockers 
were on a spontaneous, indefinite, and mainly an official strike. Because Britain was almost wholly dependent on shipping before the opening of the Channel Tunnel in 1994, all trade into and out of the country abruptly stopped in the course of one afternoon. In addition to the 65,000 dockers that walked out on Friday, there were another 90,000 workers on indefinite and usually unofficial strike. And on top of this, as many as a quarter of a million workers took some form of limited strike actions. And as an, a nice example, two hours after a visit by striking dockers, there were no holiday flights from Heathrow Airport due to solidarity actions by the ground staff. On the following Wednesday afternoon, the five were released from prison and charges. The Tory Industrial Re Relation Act had failed due to the class consciousness of the rank and file. Yet another blow to the Tory government occurred in 1972 when minus pays were not, uh, demands were not met. They went out on strike. And it was the first time since 1926 that they had been on an official strike. And the miners sent flying pickets to other industrial sites to persuade other workers to strike in solidarity, which led to railway workers refusing to transport coal and power station workers refusing to handle coal. Power shortages emerged and a state of emergency was declared after the weather had turned cold unexpectedly and voltage had been reduced across the entire national grid. The strike lasted seven weeks and it had cost the life of one picketing miner when a strike-breaking lorry driver speeded out and failed to stop after hitting him. Having closed every coal mine in the country, the miners' union sought to leverage its position by freezing existing stockpiles of fuel in place, preventing them from being transported to the power stations, businesses and heavy industries that depended on them. The pay concessions from the coal board came more than a week after the Battle of Salty Gate, when around 2,000 National Union of Mine Workers pickets descended on a coke deposit in Birmingham and were later joined by 13,000 of workers from other industries in Birmingham. Another miners' strike at the start of 74 caused the implementation of a three-day week to conserve energy. Attempting to resolve the situation, Heath called an election for February 74 attempting to obtain a mandate to face down the minus wage demand. Who governs Britain? But this resulted in the Conservatives losing their majority. And after talks with the Liberal Party to form a coalition government were unsuccessful, Heath resigned as Prime Minister and lost his role uh, as party leader to Margaret Thatcher. The blockading of coal reserves prompted the Conservative Party to adopt a more alternative attitude towards strikes for the future. And this ploy was compounded by the historic shift in Labour Party policy during the eight, late 80s and 90s towards abandoning its support for a wide freedom to strike and accepting the Tories' laws as new settlement. Whereas before the Malvinas Falklands War, uh, Thatcher was the least popular British Prime Minister since World War II. After the so-called recapture of the Falklands, she was immensely popular and she won the 1983 early elections. Now, Thatcher had been Minister for Education and Science for four years under the previous cabinet of Edward Heath. And as one of her first policy acts, she abolished free school milk for primary school pupils and this earned her the nickname Thatcher the Milk Snatcher. Uh, now, Thatcherism was not a divine ideology, but rather a cocktail that incorporated elements of traditional British conservatism, nationalism, and neoliberalism. And the latter is notoriously hard to define, but can be used in three ways. First, it is an, uh, neoliberalism is an ideology which emerged in Central Europe during the 1930s in opposition to what was uh, mistakenly called socialism and which later migrated to the economics department at the University of Chicago. Second, neoliberalism is also the strategy adopted by the alliance of state managers, politicians and employers which began to emerge from the mid to late 1970s, first in Chile, then the UK and the USA, 
and this responded to the return of an economic crisis in 73 by seeking to shift the balance of power in the workplace from labor to capital. In the first instance, by weakening the trade unions through artificially raising unemployment levels, attacking key groups of workers, and moving production to non-union countries. And finally, neoliberalism is the entire period in the history of capitalism since this strategy began to apply it in the 70s. And there have, of course, been variations, like the social neoliberalism of, for instance, Blair, which was different in many ways than the vanguard uh, neoliberalism of Thatcher and Reagan, but not least in relationship to identity politics, but the underlying economic doctrines have remained remarkably consistent. Von Hayek, uh, one of the forerunners of neoliberal ideology, argued that for most of human history, we sought cooperation rather than competition, and that this attitude of cooperation had to be stamped out of us if capitalism was ever to be truly secure. Neoliberalism has been responsible for the most pressing social issues today, from poverty, stagnant living standards to skyrocket inequalities, looming catastrophic climate change, from war and the rise of illiberal populism to the loneliness epidemic the erosion of social trust and flourishing of self-centered individualism that threatens to unravel the social fabric. Now, the day after her re-election in 1983, she appointed a new Minister of Energy with the words, we're going to have a minor strike. Nicholas Ridley, one of her key ministers, devised a strategy to reduce the union's strength. And the Ridley plan meant the government picked off trade unions one by one, starting with those that seemed as weak, such as the steel and the health workers, before moving on to more group organized groups, such as the dockers and ultimately the miners. And by 84, they were ready to take on the National Union of Mine Workers, the Trade Union of Miners. Coal was the main source of energy for Britain's power stations and steelworks. And to prepare for battle, the Tories built up coal stocks and ensured the docks could handle more and major coal imports. And the Tories recruited thousands of extra police and trained them to take on pickets. And Thatcher installed a hardline union buster, Ian McGregor, as chair of the National Coal Board. The strike began when the Tories announced a program of pit closures, starting with Corton Wood in the militant South Yorkshire area. And on the 1st of March 1984, uh, more than 160,000 miners went on strike in defense of their jobs and their communities. Uh, we saw it in the film, Coal Not Dull. Um, Coal Not Dull is still a well-known outcry. And miners walked out and sent flying pickets to the rest of the huge Yorkshire coal field, bringing all the pits out. Uh, rank and file members took the initiative. Each pit would hold a mass meeting and decide whether to join the strike. And if it did, pickets would move on to the next pit. This combined speed with democratic face-to-face -face discussions at the pit entrance and voting at mass meetings. The strike was without doubt a watershed in the country's post-war history. It pitted a hard-right conservative administration bent on class revenge after their defeat on the dockers in the previous 72-74 minor strike against a most powerful and politicized trade union in the country, regardless of cost. It was a battle between the possibility of an alternative, different kind of Britain rooted in solidarity and collective action against the individualism and private greed of the Thatcher years, symbolized by the watts of overtime cash her riot squads waved at the miners' picket lines. They stayed out for a year, sustained by millions of people across Britain and abroad who rallied to the miners' cause, raising money and solidarity and the huge support from the miners from black, Asian immigrant communities and from LGBTQ plus people broke down barriers and challenged prejudices. Now, question for you. Who, have, who of you have seen the beautiful film Pride? 
Okay. That's, that astonishes me because there's a lot, there's a lot of, there's a world to win. Please watch it. It's a beautiful film. Um, it's a film on the lesbian and gay support the minors campaign. And you see in practice how solidarity and it's a beautiful film. It, it's out there on YouTube, wherever. Try to see it. Um, now I lost my line. Okay. This was a class war with Thatcher and cronies engaged in a vicious assault on the working class. It was a struggle that shaped a generation and showed how much people's ideas can change through collective struggle. And a special mention is of the women against the pit closures. Uh, this movement brought feminist ideas into practice and empowered women to take a public role in a community with a male-dominated dominated sphere. Initially, it was women that could cross county lines for picketing without being stopped. Now, 40 years later, the strike is still being debated, and the conclusion is that Thatcher was far from being an innocent bystander. She intervened in the conflict to the point of obsession. And while the government eventually succeeded in defeating the miners, it did so only by using the biggest policy operation ever in any industrial dispute in the UK and paying out astronomical sums to enable the electricity industry to run on oil rather than coal. Uh, the excellent investigating journalist's work of Shamus Mill, I hope I pronounce his name right, um, with the enemy within, could only have been written thanks to an avalanche of evidence revelations. Uh, this one is available in our bookshop, and it's a, it's a recommendation. Uh, it's, it's terrible, actually. The, the, the state was mobilized in an unprecedented way. Lessons from repression in Northern Ireland and from the occupied colonial states were put in practice in an attempt to break the union and to evoke separation among workers. In the heart of the secret state, a smear campaign had been founded, and especially MI5 was very active with infiltration. And it has been confirmed that Thatcher on several occasions was willing to send in the army to break the strike and the government also considered declaring a state of emergency. Revelations of dirty tricks by the intelligence community, conspiracy charges that phony cash deposits had been linked to NUM leadership to drive a wedge with ordinary union members. And the government sent specially appointed magistrates to get the results they wanted. The, the Tories gave rail and other workers inflation-busting pay rises in an effort to stop them striking alongside with the miners. And they panicked. They really panicked when the dock workers planned to walk out, but avoided the strike by concessions and the retreats of union leaders. Around 8,000 policemen from all over Britain were brought into Nottinghamshire to ensure scabs to, to work and to prevent flying pickets from Yorkshire and Kent to enter the region and to enforce those pickets. For those of you who are not familiar with the wording, a scab is the one that passes a picket line in an attempt to actively break the strike and the solidarity. Now, Scotland Yard, they use the, traffic surveillance, the electronic traffic surveillance system to organize a system of roadblocks to stop flying pickets from Yorkshire and Kent. So if they spotted a car with three mail in it, that was autom automatically stopped because it was assumed that they were minors. That's when they brought the women in. But later they found out that women could be militant as well, and then women weren't allowed as well. By March, I, I, end of March 84, half the country's miners were on strike, and that rises up to 80% in the course of the strike. Mass arise of striking miners, a total of 11,000 is mentioned, and eight people have died during the strike. Now, we started the images with the Battle of Orgreef. I'll manage. Um, on the 18th of June 1984, there was a second mass picket at the Orgreave Coke Depot in South Yorkshire because of its link to steel furnaces in Scunthorpe. Approximately 8,000 pickets, the policeman says 5,000, but there were actually 8,000. Well, we were accustomed to that. 8,000 pickets faced 5,000 officers in the most violent confrontation in a year long strike. And some journalists compared it with a medieval battleground 
with mounted policemen charging after the miners. And to this day, politicians sabotage attempts for a public inquiry to the events of that dreadful day. Ian McGregor, the chairman of the National Coal Board, wrote in his biography that they encouraged Arthur Scargill, who was the leader of the NUM, to think that the Orgrave coke pit was so important. But the truth was, it was hardly mattered a job to us, beyond the fact that it kept Scargill out of Nottingham. And David Hart, a right-wing political activist and advisor to McGregor and Margaret Thatcher, claimed that Orgrave was a setup by us. He said in a 93 interview, the coke was no, of, of no interest whatsoever. We didn't need it. It was a battleground of our choosing on grounds of our choosing. The picketing of working pits in Nottinghamshire lost momentum after Orgreave, partly because many pickets were given bail conditions after being arrested, and the number of strikers in Nottinghamshire decreased. Strikers got blacklisted and sacked. MI5 declared all known miners with communist or socialist ties legit targets to gather any useful information on, and civil liberties have been trampled upon in the name of the law. The media launched a full-scale attack on the miners, denouncing their pickets as being violent. And the previous mentioned David Hart, an obscure right-wing financier, and close to Thatcher, organized and funded the Back to Work campaign, an anti-strike campaign in the coalfields, including funding a breakaway miners' union, the Union of Democratic Miners, Mine Workers. And he organized an operation that led to the sequestration of the NUM, for the, that the state took possession of the, of the funds. The tabloids, especially the Daily Telegraph from Robert Maxwell, and a popular BBC program called The Cook Report, they turned to paycheck journalism. They bribing some inner circle union runaways to launch a smear campaign on the leaders of the NUM and trying to separate them. And due to the smear campaign, in order to defend themselves, the NUM had to reveal how they went about with the confiscation of the trade union funds, um, thus giving the tabloids more ammunition for misinterpretations. Print union worker at the Sun newspaper refused to handle a front page that likened NUM President Scarcher to Hitler. Then they closed the paper down for three days after management refused a public to publish a statement for, from, from them in support of the miners. And needless to say that The Sun, owned by Rupert Murdoch, was in heavy competition with other tabloids to smear the miners. As legal <coughs> attacks on the NUM mounted, leaders of the power station workers' union relaxed their guidelines against using scab oil, gas, and, and uh, coal, and th that helped the government go through the winter without blackouts. Fundraising by minor support groups meant that the strikers continued to hold out and that every miner's child had a Christmas present in 1984. But increasing numbers of strikers began to drift back to work as the hardship became too much. Uh, NUM delegate conference narrowly voted to go back on March the 3rd on 1985 and the strikers marched back to work together after taking part in the longest mass strike in British history. In comparison, when Germany closed their last black coal mine in the late 2019, the government put retraining, job creation, local economies at the center of the closure plans. Here in the UK, communities has just been left. Your pit is shut, that's it. Get on with your life. We've seen the demise of proud communities, rising suicide rates and drug abuse. Uh, last year, I was at the Marxism Festival in London at a meeting about police repression, and I was very impressed by a miner uh, that spoke out and that told us about uh, the loss of community, the loss of perspective, the drug abuse, and then when he met uh, the uh, Socialist Workers' Party, that gave him a real purpose in life, uh, and it was the most vibrant speech I ever heard. Um, a Downing Street report into the strike said how close the government came to disaster. And Thatcher herself admitted nine years after the strike, we were in danger of losing everything. The strike could indeed have been brought down the government. The hard conclusion must be that the strike was lost over the lack of support from labor 
and the bureaucratic layer of the overarching trade union of Congress. One chair of the TUC was knighted by the Cheshire for spoken out against solidarity actions. And his, his successor worked closely with Ian McGregor, the union busting director of the National Coal Board. Solidarity could and should have been the basis for a movement which would have beaten the Tories, seen the miners win victory and driven Thatcher from office. That it didn't happen was no fault of the miners of those who worked to deliver solidarity. The Trade Union Congress and the Labour Party leaders did not match this spirit of solidarity and the union leaders proceeded to do nothing. The right wing of the labor movement opposed the strike. The left wing officials said they supported the strike but did not call action necessary to win. And the rank and file lacked the organization and confidence to act independently of the official machine to do what was necessary. Labor's leader Neil Kinnock attempted to distance labor from its union links and he was terrified that the mines would win by militant methods. For a generation of trade union leaders as many, and many activists, the idea that strikes didn't work became like a mantra. This created a vicious circle in which the relative weakness of rank and file organization had been revealed by the strike, repeatedly allowed the union bureaucracy to prevent the beginnings of resistance developing into a new, new upsurge. That further undermined workers' self-confidence but the minor strike of 84 showed that their struggle came much closer to winning than was thought of at the time. Thatcher's victory over the miners did give a boost to ruling class, to ruling class confidence, but despite their re-election in 1987, the Tories stumbled from crisis to crisis. Had the minor strike been won, it would have strengthened the argument for more workers' control and encouraged the sort of struggles that can begin to offer an alternative for capitalism. Miners were right to strike against the Tory government that was trying to destroy their lives. Strikes aren't just important because they can win workers better pay and conditions, they are essential because they can change the way that workers see themselves. A jump in time. Uh, Boris Johnson said in 2021 that Margaret Thatcher had given Britain an early big start in moving away from fossil fuels when she closed the pits. But Thatcher didn't close the pits because of environmental concerns. Defeating the miners involved building more oil burn, nuclear and gas fired power stations and encouraging the development of more open cast mines. This question was asked to a striking miners several years after the strike. What would you tell a climate activist today who may question whether it was right to defend the closure of mines? The miner responded, you've got large workforces employed in jobs that are detrimental to the environment and you just can't go and sack them or treat them like scum. You've got to find an alternative to transfer their skills, but in a society run on greed and not need, that doesn't happen. The Tories burned a lot of oil and ramped up gas usage, usage in trying to defeat us and had an idea to make the majority of Britain run on nuclear energy. After the miners' strike, the reliance on fossil fuels increased. The job was dangerous, but we were well paid and our communities had some social glue before the strike. Our areas were decimated by the fallout from the defeat of the strike, leaving most men in those communities unemployed. Rightly, a demand of recent fossil fuel workers on strike has been for a just transition to retrain in renewable energy. The key is to put workers at the heart of all the decisions about what's produced, how it's produced, and how it fits in a wider plan for a sustainable economy. I'll round up. As many years later, David Cameron's decision to hold a referendum on Europe without thinking through the consequences Thatcher found her Waterloo in the decision to introduce the poll tax without thinking it through. Dukes and Dustman both paying the same. And this caused an unforeseeable uproar within the Conservative Party itself, next to the mass protest against the introduction. The Kill the Bill protest we've seen, the bill which planned to introduce a range of anti-protest measures, tells us that the Tories uh, successfully lean towards an authoritarian approach regarding the right to protest. After the period of the minor strike, 
the secret state had swollen and grown. For instance, MI5 has tripled in size, uh, targeting Muslim activists, refugee aid campaigners, and we've seen mass criminalization of UK climate activists, some of them sent to prison for years. The British strikes in 2022, known under the name Enough is Enough, gen generated hope because they came after a deep gap in workers' struggle, a period in which you could almost hear the bosses rejoicing every time the numbers of strikes dropped. The combination of anti-union laws, the demonization of strikers, the cultural sneer against class struggle was all aimed to make the idea for resistance not just illegal and outdated, but largely unthinkable. Strikes are on a, on a blip. The extreme policing of the miners' strike made generations after the strike aware that the state and its suppressing apparatus is by any means not neutral. What can be created can also be broken down. And as far as neoliberalism is concerned, the sooner the better. Thank you very much.